Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 184 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Early North America was a place rife with violent conflict. Between the 17th and 19th centuries, we find a lot of conflict between different Native American peoples, Native American peoples and colonists, colonists from one European empire versus the colonists from another European empire, settlers from one American state versus settlers from another American state. Plus, in the 19th century, we also see a lot of conflict between Americans, Native Americans, Canadians, and Mexicans. Today, we're going to explore some of the causes of the violent conflicts that took place in early America by looking specifically at Native America and the ways that Native Americans use guns to shape their lives in the course of North American colonial and indigenous history. Our guide for this exploration is David J. Silverman, a professor of history at George Washington University and the author of Thundersticks, Firearms and the Violent Transformation of Native America. Now, during our investigation of Native America, David reveals information about the arrival of guns in early America and Native Americans' initial interest in them, details about Native Americans' trade for guns, and the ways Native Americans use guns to revolutionize their lives. But first, I just wanted to thank you for attending our listener meetups in Sacramento, California and Las Vegas, Nevada a couple of weeks ago. I really enjoyed meeting you and getting to know more about you and your interests. It's always fun for me to meet new people and to connect real people to all the email addresses and social media accounts I interact with. So thank you for coming out and we'll definitely do it again in Cleveland, Philadelphia and Boston this summer. Okay, ready to explore how Native Americans use guns to shape their lives? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is a professor of history at George Washington University. He's a specialist in Native American and colonial American history and an award-winning scholar who has written four books, including Red Brethren, The Brother Town in Stockbridge Indians, and The Problem of Race in Early America, and most recently, Thundersticks, Firearms and the Violent Transformation of Native America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, David Silverman. Thanks so much for having me. Thunder Sticks is an exploration into how and why one group of Native Americans after another used firearms to revolutionize their lives between the 17th and 19th centuries. David, it seems like we should start our conversation about Native Americans' historic use of guns with the arrival of guns in North America. So would you tell us a bit about when guns arrived on the continent and when Native Americans started to take notice of them? Sure. It's safe to assume that guns arrived with the very first explorers and certainly in the very first colonies. And we know from written accounts of these expeditions that Native people took notice of firearms right from the very beginning. To give you an example, we see from the Lost Roanoke Colony that Indigenous people along the coast of North Carolina very quickly took notice of guns and linked the firing of those weapons to the onset of epidemic diseases among them. So right away, they're interested in these weapons. We also see in Jamestown Colony that Wahunsinacock or Powhatan, the Indian leader of the native people of Lower Chesapeake Bay, started to demand firearms in trade almost from the outset. So native people notice these guns right away, take an interest in them right away, and want to acquire them right away as well. Why do you think Native Americans were so interested in guns and why do you think they sought to acquire them so quickly? Well, I think we have to distinguish between initial interest and then long-term interest. And I think the reasons for initial interest have attracted the greatest amount of attention from historians, and I think to the detriment of the way we tell the story of Native people and firearms. Historians have always been interested in the ways in which Native people were awed by the pyrotechnics of firearms, by the sound, by the flash, by the smoke. 
And the assumption has been that native interest over the long term stemmed from what historians have characterized as a psychological effect in indigenous people, that the awe and terror of these guns was what drew their interest. Now, I have no doubt that initially those features of firearms did indeed draw native interest. But over the long term, the reason that native people were interested in acquiring firearms was that they were difference makers in warfare. And for that matter, they were useful tools in hunting. So it was the usefulness of firearms over the long term, rather than some kind of psychological effect that explains Native interest in these weapons. Native Americans were interested in guns because they were difference makers in warfare and useful hunting tools. Additionally, Jared also wonders whether Native Americans were interested in guns because of European diseases. He wonders whether European diseases might have created demographic, economic, and political pressures that, you know, pushed Native Americans to adopt and acquire guns. So what do you think of this, David? Do you think European diseases could have caused some of Native Americans' long-term interest in guns? Well, there's no question that disease is a driver of Native American warfare. And insofar as it served that function, it also helped to fuel Native interest in the acquisition of firearms. Because as I said, Native people recognized very early on that guns were difference makers in intertribal warfare. What we see in Native America is that among many tribes, the Five Nations Iroquois, foremost among them, but this is a rule that applies fairly broadly, that as Native people are losing population to epidemic diseases, they step up raids on other peoples to capture mostly women and children for the purposes of adoption into the tribe in order to sustain and even grow their numbers. Once they acquire guns, the guns become a mechanism by which they can conduct these raids. So yes, there most certainly was a link between disease, native interest in firearms and warfare. I wonder if we could explore if and how Native Americans became connoisseurs of guns, if you will. Because as I found in my own research about the trade that took place between Native Americans and the Dutch, British and American settlers in early Albany, New York, Native Americans knew exactly what kind of goods they wanted and how they wanted those goods. And they really weren't afraid to ask for the goods that they preferred. So I wonder, did Native American savviness in trade carry over into their desire for guns? No question about it. And here, too, I think there's been a mistaken impression in literature and in popular culture about Native consumer power in these transactions. There's a widespread assumption that Native people got the worst of European gun technology, that they got third-rate throwaway muskets and pistols. That's patently untrue. Native power in colonial America, by virtue of Native people's status as the producers of furs and slaves, and their military prowess and the need of colonies to cultivate Native people as allies, meant that European suppliers of firearms had to respond to Native demands. And what that meant was that Native people got guns that were tailored to their specifications. And what they wanted, this applies across the continent during the entirety of my study between the 1630s and the late 1800s, what Native people wanted were light, durable firearms at low cost. What's more, they also got certain details added to these guns in accordance with their specifications. One of my favorite details is a serpent side plate, basically an ornament to the gun, which one sees first in Dutch trade guns in the 17th century, and then other fur trade firms begin to pick up on this decoration. The French do it, uh, later the Americans do it in the Missouri River Valley, and this becomes a feature of native trade guns for the better part of 200 years. Native people favored this serpent side plate because they associated firearms with the power of shamans. And shamans in Native American culture derived their power by having a vision of the underwater horned serpent, one of the spirits of the Native American cosmos. What's more, that serpent was associated with the material flint. And flint was used in the firing mechanism of firearms. 
And then a final connection here between the serpent side plate and Native American cosmology is that the serpent's analog in the native cosmos was the thunderbird, a cosmological figure that streaked through the sky, shooting lightning from its eyes. Well, the process of the thunderbird shooting lightning from its eyes was analogous to the pyrotechnics of the firearm. So here we see native cosmology shaping native consumer preferences and in turn shaping the decoration of Native American trade guns. On a more minor note, we see, for instance, in the Northern Plains and Rocky Mountain West, that native trade guns had large trigger guards that could accommodate native warriors and hunters wearing mittens when they were firing them. So in these ways and more, we see native consumer preferences shaping the way that Europeans manufactured guns for the indigenous North American market. Now, just to explore the actual trade for guns a bit more, in all of the case studies David explores in his book, Thundersticks, Native Americans traded for firearms with multiple European and American groups. David, what did having access to multiple trading partners mean for Native Americans' acquisition of guns? I mean, why did it prove important to have many trade partners? Well, some of this is just basic consumer power, as any of your listeners will certainly understand from their own shopping. When you can shop at more than one purveyor, you're likelier to get a better deal. Native people were as aware of that as modern day consumers are. There was a political element to all of this as well. One of the things I assert in Thundersticks is that munitions, you know, guns, powder, and shot were the only category of European trade good in Native America that we can truly characterize as a need. Now, there's no doubt that Native people traded for a wide variety of European items, cloth and clothing foremost among them, liquor, glass beads, and the like. Native people didn't want to do without those items. They could have done without those items if they wanted to. They weren't going to die without them. But munitions were a necessity. They were a necessity because Native people needed them in order to defend themselves against other gun-toting natives. And thus, to get back to your original question, Native people cultivated multiple sources of supply so they wouldn't be at risk of being cut off from their sources of munitions in the event of wars with those suppliers. And so what one sees is that, for instance, in the Native Northeast, Native peoples opened up trade lines to the Dutch, the English, the French, with different colonies of the English Empire. In the Southeast, likewise, Native people open up trade lines with the Spanish, the French of Louisiana, the English of South Carolina and Virginia. In the lower Mississippi River Valley, they open up trade lines to the French in Louisiana, the Spanish in Texas and New Mexico, eventually the British and the Americans on the upper Mississippi River. Oft overlooked, and you know, this kind of playoff system is pretty well established in literature, But oft overlooked is the way that indigenous people, particularly those deep in the interior of the continent, where they were far away from centers of European population and power, and sometimes far away even from the nearest trade post, they opened up relations with indigenous middlemen, usually coming from small, relatively less powerful tribes who would tack back and forth between European trade centers and powerful native groups in the interior to ferry European munitions and other trade goods to those interior groups, and in turn to take furs, bison robes, and slaves from those groups and bring them back to European trade centers. And through all of these means, Native people throughout the continent usually were in a position where no one polity could choke them off from their essential supplies of munitions. Okay, now that we have a baseline for how Native Americans conducted their firearms trade in general, I wonder if we could explore a few of the case studies in your book so that we can get a better feel for how some specific Native American peoples acquired and used their firearms. I think here we should start with the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois people you mentioned earlier, as they were one of the first Native American peoples to acquire and adopt European firearms. So, David, Would you tell us how and why the Haudenosaunee people sought guns and how they used their firearms? Sure. They sought guns for the same reasons that other Native people in later times did as well. They could see very quickly that these weapons were incredibly powerful and that they could turn the tide of their people's wars with other indigenous nations. And I actually think it's worth 
pausing on that point. For most Native people, the most immediate use they have for these weapons is in the context of intertribal wars. Eventually, they'll need them for their wars with colonial powers. That's not their main concern initially. So the Haudenosaunee gain early access to these weapons much earlier than other groups, largely because of their connections with the Dutch of New Netherland. Dutch New Netherland was established on the Hudson River you know, with a political base on the island of Manhattan and a fur trade post on the upper Hudson River on the site of modern day Albany, which was at the easternmost site of Mohawk territory, the Mohawks being the easternmost nation of the Five Nations Iroquois League. The Dutch realized very quickly that if they're going to establish trade and political alliances with the Haudenosaunee, they're going to have to supply them with the goods that they want. And the goods that these people wanted, above all else, were guns, powder, and shot. The Dutch were in very little position to dictate to these people what they would trade to them. The Dutch recognized that if they didn't provide guns to the Haudenosaunee, then the Haudenosaunee would take their trade elsewhere, particularly to the English of New England and Chesapeake Bay. What's more, there was no way for the Dutch to expect for their fur trade post on the upper Hudson River to survive with the Mohawks abutting them unless they essentially paid rent to the Mohawks, which was to provide them with the trade goods that they wanted, and for that matter, to provide them on a regular basis with free blacksmithing services and gifts of powder and shot. Those were the conditions by which the Haudenosaunee allowed the Dutch to operate on the edges of their territory. It's really interesting to me that you said the Dutch were really worried that the Haudenosaunee would go off to New England and trade with the New Englanders or even off to New France and possibly trade with the French. Because it seemed like when I read your book, Thundersticks, that the French were actually really reluctant to trade firearms to the Native Americans, as were the New Englanders. In fact, it seemed like both the French and the New Englanders were peeved at the Dutch for trading firearms to Native Americans like the Haudenosaunee. Well, here I think we need to make a distinction between statements from English and French authorities and the actual behavior of English and French fur traders. One of the main themes of Thunder Six is that colonial states and European empires, despite their pretensions to power, had very little control over their traders in Indian country. Traders in Indian country want to corner the Indian market. Native furs are among the most lucrative resources in early colonial settings. And in some colonial settings, they're the basis for colonial economies for decades and decades. Think New Netherland, New France, Russia and Alaska, and the like. Thus, they had to respond to their native customers' demands. And as a result, these traders would routinely provide native people with guns, powder, and shot in violation of the laws of their colonies and the laws of their empires, sometimes even under the threat of capital punishment. One normally doesn't think, for instance, of Puritan New Englanders as rogue traders, but there's no question about it that there was a thriving munitions trade in colonial New England, despite the laws of colonies like Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Plymouth designed to discourage that trade. So now that we know how the Haudenosaunee sought and traded for firearms, we should really explore how guns changed their very way of life. David, how did guns change the patterns of Haudenosaunee life between the 17th and 18th centuries? And I guess while we're at it, we also need to talk about how the patterns of their neighbors' lives changed too, as the Haudenosaunee possession and use of firearms didn't just impact the Iroquois. Well, the most fundamental way is that they became the dominant military power in the Northeast in the early to mid 17th century. Over the course of a few decades, they ran over one group after another, mostly Iroquoian speaking groups of the Great Lakes region, and then expanded their conquests to include the Ohio River Valley, the Susquehanna River Valley, and even as far west as the Ohio. And some of their raids took place just west of the Mississippi River. There's no question that firearms were a key component of their military dominance. 
generally speaking, the victories that Haudenosaunee people won over these various tribal nations, they came at the expense of peoples who were lightly armed or entirely unarmed. And indeed, I see a strategy in Iroquois strikes of targeting people that they knew did not have access to European firearms. Iroquois or Haudenosaunee military dominance begins to ebb as we get past the halfway mark of the 17th century as other native people begin to close the arms gap. In other words, what we see is a vast regional intertribal arms race in which the Iroquois are dominant at first, but in which they're receiving as much punishment as they're giving as the century wears on. European firearms also made their way into the hands of Native Americans who lived in the southeastern part of North America, too. Would you tell us about the slave wars that took place in the southeast during the 17th century and about how Native Americans used these wars to their advantage? Sure. And there's a connection here to the story of Iroquois military dominance in the early to mid 17th century. So among the peoples that the Iroquois conquered and then displaced were the Eries, who, when we first encountered them in the historical record, were residing on the Great Lakes, on the lake that now bears their name. Their survivors of Iroquois raids moved south, first to Virginia, in what's now Virginia, and eventually into what's now South Carolina, where they established trading relationships with the English colonists of those places. And The trade that they establish is predominantly a trade of human captives, of indigenous captives from other tribal communities in exchange for munitions. What the Eries had concluded was that they were never going to become victims of gun-toting marauders again, as had been the case in their earlier relations with the Haudenosaunee. Hence, this trade to the South. Eventually, these Eries become known as Westos because of their commerce at a trade post on the site of modern-day Richmond, Virginia, which was known as Westover. So the Eries become known as the Westos. Once South Carolina is founded, these Westos direct their slaves for arms traffic to that colony. And there's a good reason for this. One is that Native people within the orbit of Virginia were becoming as equally well-armed as the Westos, thus robbing the Westos of the advantage that they had enjoyed when they first arrived in the territory. But another reason was that there were ample enslavable populations farther to the south, particularly in the case of Native people living within the missions of Spanish Florida. The Spanish were one of the very few empires that managed to do a pretty good job of preventing its people from trading munitions to indigenous people. And thus, you see tens of thousands of Native people living in these mission communities with little to no firearms to protect them. And the Spanish themselves were also underarmed. And so first the Westos and then a succession of other Native people in the Southeast begin targeting these mission communities to seize people to then trade to South Carolina in exchange for munitions. What this does is it creates yet another kind of arms race, not unlike what we saw in Iroquois, in the area of Iroquois raids, in which Native people discovered that they have to establish commerce with Europeans to acquire the guns that will protect them from gun-toting marauders. The difference in the Southeast is that this is an exchange not of furs for guns, but of human beings for guns. And so one could either be enslaved in the Southeast or become a slaver to acquire the weapons that one needed both for defense and predation. And so a sequence of militant slaving nations arises in the wake of the original Westo trade. The Savannas, the Yamases, the Creeks, the Chickasaws, Cherokees, Catabas, and still more nations all get enveloped in this trade to the point that between 1680 and 1720, this is a region in which really no one is safe from the threat of enslavement. What's curious about these southeastern slaving wars is that between 1710 and 1730, these wars actually transformed into anti-colonial wars. So David, what changed in these wars and 
Why did some Southeastern Native Americans decide to take an anti-colonial stance while other nations decided to stick by their colonial allies? There are a couple of things at play here. One is fairly early on, a pattern emerges in which Native people who are the primary slave raiding allies of European colonies one day find themselves betrayed by those colonies the next, usually when the slaving nation is becoming too strong and begins representing a threat to the interests of the slave purchasing colony. So, for instance, in the case of the Westos, South Carolina eventually makes an alliance with the Savannas or Shawnees, another group which had been displaced by Iroquois raids from the Ohio River Valley, and makes an agreement with them to attack the Westos, attacks which take place with guns supplied by South Carolina. Soon, the Savannas are being attacked by groups allied with South Carolina, such as the Catawbas. The Yamases, who appear to be a composite group formed out of survivors from Westo attacks on the missions, are the next group. They form into a militant slaving group. And as we know, in 1715 and 16, they end up at war with South Carolina. So there's this cycle which Native people are picking up on, and they don't want to be next. Their fear that they're next stems from their very successes in the slave trade. Take the Tuscaroras, for instance, who go to war with North Carolina in 1711. They had been early participants in this slave trade, raiding other groups and also allowing their villages to serve as gun trading entrepots in the trade. Well, by the time we get to 1711, they had effectively outhunted the surrounding territory of human beings to capture as slaves. The only remaining groups were now as well armed as they. It was too risky a venture to try to enslave them. But at the same time, they needed to keep supplying themselves with arms in order to defend themselves. And they had developed a taste for European trade goods, which they were no longer willing to do without. Thus, they start running up enormous debts with European traders. As those debts start spiraling out of control, the Tuscaroras can tell that they're going to be next. That when they can't pay up, when their debts become outstanding beyond the point to which Europeans are willing to tolerate, the Europeans are going to make an alliance with another slaving nation to target the Tuscaroras. Now, in that particular case, North Carolina survives the war despite early losses at the hands of the Tuscaroras and their native allies by virtue of South Carolina enlisting a roster of militant slaving nations to target the Tuscaroras. And South Carolina enlists these groups in no small degree by plying them with arms. But it's only a few years later before those very same groups, Yamases, Catawbas, Lower Creeks, Cherokees and the like, realized that the reasons that the Tuscaroras had risen up were now shared by themselves, that they had become desperate debtors to Carolina traders and were likely the next targets for slave attacks. And the breaking point comes when South Carolina, in what I really would characterize as a ham-handed policy, decides to take a census of its slaving Indian allies, which the natives interpret as a first step towards enslaving them all. And thus, over the course of several days, they kill all the Carolina traders in their communities and then set South Carolina under attack. Fears about firearms, enslavement, and even Native American autonomy were prevalent during the 18th century. And they weren't just limited to the East Coast either. In fact, fear, guns, and ammunition played central roles in driving Native American peoples further west, in the Great Lakes and Ohio Valley regions, to rebel against British authority between 1763 and 1768. And after we take just a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, we will explore the roles that these fears and guns played in an event we now call Pontiac's Rebellion. The Omohundro Institute and I are still running our listener survey, and we're hoping we can convince you to spare us just a few minutes of your time to share your feedback with us. The OA and I have put together the survey because we want to get to know more about you and hear what you think about the show. Because after all, Ben Franklin's world exists for you. The OA and I want you to enjoy discovering more about early American history each and every week. And doing that in the most enjoyable, effective, and sustainable way possible is our number one priority. That's why I'm asking you for a big favor. 
Can you please spare me just a few minutes of your time to complete our online survey? It really doesn't take more than just a few minutes to complete. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash survey and share your thoughts with us. Please know that your participation will really help us keep the show fresh and available for download every Tuesday. Plus, everyone who completes the survey will be entered into a drawing for signed copies of some really great books about early American history. Again, our survey is available at benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. Thank you so much for your help with this. I really look forward to hearing from you. David, would you tell us about Pontiac's Rebellion and the roles that fear and firearms played in fomenting that rebellion? Pontiac's Rebellion comes at the tail end of the Seven Years' War, also known as the French and Indian War, in which Native peoples participated widely, disproportionately as allies of the French and to a lesser extent as allies of the British. During that war, I estimate that more munitions entered Indian country than in any 10-year period previous to that date. And it's because the various imperial powers are courting indigenous peoples with gifts of arms and subsidized trade. Well, fast forward to the French defeat and the British taking over New France and its various trade posts throughout the Ohio River Valley and the Great Lakes region. Britain's commander-in-chief in North America, Sir Geoffrey Amherst, contended that by virtue of the French defeat, New France's Indian allies had been defeated also, an idea which, according to contemporaries, made them stare. (laughs) In other words, they simply couldn't understand such thinking. Now, Britain had built up an unmanageable national debt in the course of the Seven Years' War. And so there was a lot of pressure on Amherst to cut costs wherever he could. One of the places that he identifies as an opportunity to cut costs is Indian country, particularly the gifts that imperial powers had to ply Native people with as a condition of their presence in Indian country. Now, before the 1750s, the French had for decades been in the habit dictated to them by Native people of routinely providing free blacksmithing services to indigenous people, both in French forts and by stationing French blacksmiths in Indian villages. When Native people stopped by French posts, they would get gifts of powder and shot. So Native people's expectations were that when the British took over for the French, they would continue those customs. And that moreover, the British, by virtue of their commercial supremacy in Europe, would offer better quality, lower priced trade goods than the French ever had. Well, they discovered that that's not what Amherst intended at all. Amherst's orders were for British post commanders to halt these practices, to stop providing Native people with gifts of munitions and free blacksmithing, and instead to provide these things to Native people only in exchange for services rendered. In other words, he didn't see himself as a guest in Indian country who had to abide by the will of the landlords, if you will, but rather as a conquering power. What's more, he did everything he could to scale back the munitions trade in Indian country, such as requiring licenses for fur traders doing business among Native people, restricting traders from doing their business in Indian villages and instead requiring them to ply their wares only in a select number of forts where they would be supervised and placing limits on the amount of powder and shot a Native customer could purchase at any one time. An amount, by the way, which was less than a hunter required for a full year. Suffice it to say, Native people were enraged at these policies not to mention the tone in which they were implemented, which was utterly insulting. And those grievances, combined with a number of other ones, contribute to a dozen or more tribes sacking British-occupied forts throughout the Ohio country and the Great Lakes region in 1763 and attacking British settlements in what's now western and northeastern Pennsylvania and western Virginia. We've now followed how Native Americans in the Northeast, Southeast, and Midwest all used firearms by the mid-18th century, and how they used them in their own ways and for their own purposes. 
And I'd like for us to explore one more of the interesting case studies from Thundersticks. European firearms and Native Americans' use of them spread all the way through the interior of North America to the Pacific coast. In fact, Native peoples could be found using European firearms as far west as Alaska. David, would you tell us about Makina and the Nootka people and how they obtained and used firearms to revolutionize their lives? So the Nootka people of the west coast of what's now known as Vancouver Island were, like most of their neighbors, among the most isolated people on the face of the globe up to around the year 1780. I mean, they were in touch with a wide variety of Native people, to be sure. But unlike Indigenous people elsewhere in North America, they had scant contact with Europeans or Natives from deep in the interior of the continent. All this changed after Captain James Cook's voyages of the 1770s and then the publication of his travel journals in 1783 and 1784. During Cook's explorations of what's now known as the Pacific Northwest, he acquired a cache of otter pelts, which later in his journey, he sold in China for an absolutely incredible profit. Well, when other merchants read these journals, it began a scramble to the Pacific Northwest to acquire those pelts. And again, for the purposes of sale in China, the dream of European merchants for centuries had been to find something of value that the Chinese wanted to purchase in exchange for their tea and porcelain and silks. Well, now they finally had it. Maquina's community of Yuquat, or Nootka, also known as Friendly Cove, was ideally suited to dominate this trade in its early stages. Yuquat was located at a sheltered harbor on a dangerous coast, which generally lacks such places. What's more, Maquina, a chief of the Nootchalnooth people, was capable of using his political influence and economic influence to funnel otter pelts from a 300-mile range into his community so that he could then dominate this trade with European nations. And the proof of his influence can be seen in the fact that by the year 1792, there are 22 vessels on the coast, most of them anchored at Uquat. During a 10-year period of the trade between 1785 and 1795, 70 of 107 vessels in this trade, most of them out of Boston, a lesser number out of Britain. So 70 out of 107 vessels anchor at Uquat. And by virtue of McQuinn's leadership of that community, he became the dominant figure in the early stages of this otter trade. What he wanted and what other Native people of the Pacific Northwest Coast wanted in exchange for those otter pelts was above all guns, powder, and shot, which they used to dominate their neighbors, to set up tributary relationships, but also, I mean, a feature which was characteristic of their particular culture, to give these goods away in potlatch ceremonies, these elaborate giveaways of wealth in which chiefs asserted their dominance over other peoples and established relationships of dependency which they then parlayed in their politics. The story of Maquina and the Nuka people also reveals that Europeans and Americans often subjected Native Americans and their leaders to abuse, even as they sought to trade with them for valuable trade goods such as otter pelts. Of course, the story also reveals that Native Americans sometimes fought this abuse. David, would you tell us about Maquina's raid on the trade ship Boston? And what led him and the Nootka people to fight back against this New English trading vessel and its crew? So even though Maquina is growing rich and ever more powerful through the Otters for Arms trade during its opening years, he's also suffering regular abuse at the hands of these traders. And there's no rhyme or reason to the pattern of abuse other than the fact that these Europeans aren't there to stay. They're there to conduct their commercial transactions and then to sail off. It probably also didn't help that there was a great deal of drinking in these contexts, which didn't bring out the best behavior in anybody. And so over the years, McQuinna begins to accumulate a long list of grievances against European peoples. 
Some ship captains robbed his community when he was out hunting. Another ship captain, in a really bad attempt at a joke, blew up a store of gunpowder under a seat on which McQuinnah had been sitting. There were some skirmishes in which some of McQuinnah's people were killed, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, again, McQuinnah is building up grievances against these European ship captains over the years. What's more, as we begin to approach the year 1803, McQuinnah's and Uquat's command over this trade is slipping. The otter population is very slow to reproduce. So once a people had been harvesting otter for sale in their neighborhood for a certain period of time, almost invariably, they're going to hunt out that resource. And unless they can funnel in pelts from a broad hinterland, they're going to lose control of the trade. Well, McQuinna had been able to funnel pelts from a broad hinterland into his community for a while, but over time, European geographical knowledge of this region began to expand, and European ships began to anchor at other places along the coast, thus empowering chiefs that McQuinna had held in subservience before that time. So by the year 1803, McQuinna is growing increasingly disenchanted with the trade. The breaking point comes when the ship Boston sails into his harbor with a rather cantankerous captain named John Salter. Now, Salter at one point lends McQuinna a fowling gun, and McQuinna takes it to go out and hunt waterfowl. But the gun doesn't work properly, so McQuinna brings it back to the ship, complains to Salter about it, and Salter flies into a rage and begins shouting curses at McQuinna. Now, McQuinna had been involved in the trade long enough that, like many other Native people dealing with shipboard explorers or fur traders, he knew what curses meant in European languages. For McQuinna, this was all too much. And so in the wake of this insult by Captain Salter, he organizes his community to sack the boat. They go out in a flotilla of canoes with McQuinna dressed in war dress, a symbol that Salter wasn't capable of interpreting. They hid knives under piles of otter pelts, which they pretended they wanted to trade. And then at the given signal, all the knives came out. The uh, native men on board dispatched all of the European sailors and spared the lives of only two of them. It is no coincidence that one of those lives was of the blacksmith, a man named John Jewett. The other man who was spared was a fellow sailor of Jewett who Jewett claimed was his father. So in a native effort to keep the blacksmith in relatively good humor, they spared that sailor too. Jewett would spend the next 28 months in captivity among the Uquat people as a special slave of McQuinna, performing blacksmithing services for the Nuchalnuth people, and in the process compiling an ethnographic account of these folks, unlike any that we have in the historical record. It's a remarkable story, and someone should make a movie of it. Yeah, it sounds like they should. And of course, the story is also remarkable because it highlights the value the Nuka placed on firearms, as the only two people they spared were the gunsmith and the man they presumed was the gunsmith's father. That's exactly right. And on blacksmithing in particular and gunsmithing in particular, and you know, this is a theme that cuts across the various case studies that make up my book that I think has gone underappreciated in the historical scholarship. You look at almost any major Native American treaty negotiation with a European colony, and among the first points that Native people want to negotiate is those colonies providing blacksmithing for free or reduced prices to indigenous people. We see that a basic condition that Native people impose on Europeans to establish military posts or fur trade posts in their territory is the right of Native people to have cheap or free access to the blacksmith of that location. And here too, the Nuchalnuth people had been getting their arms repaired by Jewett for days before this attack. They realized that having him as a captive in their community would at once provide them with valuable services in terms of getting their guns and tools repaired, but that also other Native people from other communities would have to repair to them in order to have access to Jewett. David, you looked at a lot of different case studies in Thundersticks, and during our conversation, we've briefly explored some of the details of just four of those case studies. And I wonder, since you have looked at a lot of historical sources and you have so many details in your book, 
Would you give us like, say, the 30,000 foot view on the ways that you see Native Americans as having used guns to revolutionize their lives between the 17th and 19th centuries? Sure. First and foremost, as I mentioned earlier, guns, powder and shot become collectively the only category of trade good that indigenous people in North America need from Europeans. And the reason they need them is that firearms become the primary determinant in whether Native people will win victories or be capable of defending themselves against other Native people. So in that respect alone, Native people revolutionize their lives with guns, but they do so in a variety of other ways too. Across the continent, Native people begin using guns as their primary tool in hunting. This is particularly true for deer hunting people east of the Mississippi River and for caribou and moose hunters to the north. But once indigenous people on the Great Plains get access to rifles and six shooters in the mid-19th century, they begin using them to hunt bison as well. In turn, as these tools became increasingly critical to Native American warfare and hunting, Native people established political economies to secure their access to these weapons. And by that, I mean this. They used the guns to conquer hunting grounds that they then used to harvest pelts and bison robes that they traded for more munitions. They used the munitions to acquire captives that they traded as slaves to Europeans for more munitions. Some of the captives, as in the case of Native people on the Great Plains, they would use to process furs, in the case of the Plains, bison robes, which they then traded to Europeans for more munitions. Likewise, Native people adjusted their diplomacy so that they could open up multiple sources of supply so that no one polity would have a chokehold on them in terms of being able to cut off their supply to guns, powder, and shot. So they open up relations with multiple colonies, multiple empires, with Native American middlemen. They incorporate guns into their religious rituals. Mas- their notions of masculinity depended on a man's ability to wield a gun effectively, to capture guns from his enemies. Likewise, the way that they defined femininity became related to guns, because one of the things that I found is that even very well armed indigenous peoples generally refused to allow Native women to use guns, even when their lives were in danger. In Native material culture and art, guns made a difference. Native people began to depict their war honors on teepees, on shirts, on various other forms of artifice. Women began to sew gun bags and other paraphernalia for the use of gun-toting men. And so in all these ways, Native people used guns to transform their lives. And let me emphasize that formulation here. Notice that I'm saying that Native people used guns to transform their lives, rather than asserting that guns changed Native American lives. Guns are an inanimate object. They can't act without human volition. Native people were agents in all of this, not passive actors. You know, today, Americans really wrestle with ideas about guns and who should have access to what kinds of firearms. And before we jump into the time warp, I wonder, do you think there are any lessons we can draw from Native Americans' experience with firearms that may help us better understand today's discussion and debates over guns? I don't think there are direct lessons, but I think there are general ones that should serve as cautionary tales. And I think people on both sides of the gun debate can find some support for their positions in this story. For those who are opposed to gun regulations, they might pull from this book the centuries-long inability of European and colonial states to regulate the gun trade. The argument against gun control has been that these laws are unenforceable. Now, I don't subscribe to that view in our modern context, but in this early modern context, there's no question about it, that rogue gun runners were everywhere in North America. Those against gun regulation might also point out that when one group of people had an advantage in arms, the only thing that brought an end to their run of dominance was when other Native people acquired similar armaments and a state of detente set in. I would certainly see that point. 
But I think the larger point is this. When everyone's armed, lots of people get killed by guns. And that's what I'm seeing in this world more than anything else. This book is a vision of a world in which everyone is armed and in which the slightest disagreements can turn into running gun battles. What I see is an incredible amount of death and despair in this world. And it's certainly not a world in which I would have wanted to live. Now it's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. David, your Time Warp question comes from Bill. Bill would like to know, in your opinion, what might have happened if Native peoples had rejected European and American firearms and just stuck with their traditional weapons, ways of war, and hunting? That's an interesting counterfactual question. I think there are two sides to it. I think one is there would have been a lot more Native people. What one sees in this book is that the initial response of Native people to acquiring firearms was to turn them against their indigenous neighbors. And there's no way for us to calculate the total loss of life in these intertribal gun wars. But I can tell you just from the accumulation of anecdotes that the loss of life was absolutely enormous. On the other hand, though, Native people, by virtue of the skill and savvy with which they arm themselves, were always well armed right up to the very moment of their subjugation to Euro American authority. And I contend, and I believe demonstrate in this book, that they held off subjugation to Euro American authority for as long as they did, which was quite considerable in no small degree because of the strength of their armaments and their skills in using them. So I believe that if Native people had refused to acquire and use European munitions, yes, there would have been more indigenous people, but they also would have been subjugated a lot quicker than they were. And here, I think there's an important point to illustrate here. I think very often, popular audiences and to a lesser degree historians ascribe Native American dispossession and subjugation to European technological superiority. Think of Jared Diamond's triad of guns, germs, and steel. In the case of guns, that is just not true. Native people were as well-armed as Europeans right up to the moment of their subjugation. They weren't outgunned. They were swarmed by a much, much larger Euro-American population. So, David, what aspect of Native American history are you researching and writing about now? The year 2020 is coming up, which is the 400th anniversary of the founding of Plymouth Colony. And anniversaries are rare opportunities for historians to reach popular audiences with their knowledge. So what I'm writing is a Wampanoag Indian-centered account of Plymouth Colony and the Thanksgiving holiday up to this very day. If we have any lingering questions about Native Americans and their use of firearms, how can we contact you? The best way to contact me is through the uh, George Washington University History website where my profile is listed. I don't have much of an online profile other than that, but I certainly welcome emails from your listeners. David Silverman, thank you for helping us explore the experiences Native Americans had with guns and firearms. It's been my great pleasure. Native Americans showed an interest in guns as soon as European explorers brought them to North America. Although Europeans like to recount how they use guns to inspire fear and awe in Native Americans, Native Americans viewed firearms as valuable tools that would help them hunt, protect them against mourning wars and slave raids, and to make war on other Native American peoples and enemies. According to David's research, it didn't take long after Europeans introduced guns to North America for guns, gunpowder, and ammunition to become the only trade goods Native Americans could not live without. Native Americans use guns to transform their lives. They also use their savviness as traders to impact the manufacture of European guns. Native Americans wanted to use guns as tools for hunting and making war, and they wanted guns to fit into their lives. So they told European and American traders what they wanted, light, durable firearms at low cost, 
guns with large trigger guards so that they could fire them when they wore gloves. And guns with serpent side plates that paid respect to the power of their shamans and their cosmology. They also wanted access to these guns through as many trading partners as possible. As David noted, guns became so important to Native Americans' way of life that they did not want to lose access to them at any time. Guns fomented and exacerbated conflict in Native America and in early America. As David mentioned, we will never have an exact number of the people who died in early America as the result of guns. What we do know is what the historical record tells us. And it tells us, that the loss of life was enormous. You can find more information about David, his book, Thundersticks, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com 184. The Omohundro Institute and I are still running our listener survey. Please spare us a few minutes of your time to share your feedback with us. We're hosting the survey on SurveyMonkey, so you can take it on any of your mobile devices, as well as on your computer. You'll find the survey at benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. Finally, did David reveal anything that surprised you about the ways Native Americans used guns to revolutionize their lives? I'd love to know, so send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.